You're in the bullpen. You might want to watch where you're stepping. Here's American Shorthorn Association CEO, Monty Souls. Welcome to the Shorthorn Bullpen. I'm Monty Souls, your host. We're here in Orlando, Florida at the NCBA Convention and Trade Show. And today we've got Dr. Bob Weber with us from Kansas State University. Maybe everybody doesn't know Dr. Bob like I know him yeah. over to history and so on. Tell us a little bit where you come from, how you end up where you're at. Yeah, thanks, Monty, for the opportunity to be here. Um, my background, uh, worked uh, breed associations and academia, my adult working career. Um, currently at uh, K-State, been at K-State since 2011, came as cow-calf extension specialist um, with focus on beef cattle genetics, um, so a research appointment in genetics as well. Grew up in southern Colorado on Hereford operation. Um, my family continues to be involved in, in the Hereford business as well. Um, while in, in animal science at K-State, um, as faculty coordinator for the purebred beef unit, so we had Angus Hereford and Simmental and Sim Angus cattle at that operation, so helped work closely with uh, Shane Work, our unit manager there, having a bull sale and teaching students about seed stock production. Long time uh, uh, engagement with the uh, Beef Improvement Federation, so worked in, in uh, Central Region Secretary for a while, um, and I think year three or four as Executive Director for BIF. So um, worked a lot with breed associations and seed stock producers on uh, genetic improvement strategies. Uh, end up doing a lot of, a lot of talks yet in the extension space on beef cattle genetics, and so um, fun, fun to be here at NCBA, and great to see it. Well, we're glad to have you with us. You made a presentation here, worked on some of the program yep. here, and and really was addressing some crossbreeding and the advantages of doing crossbreeding and heterosis yep. and hybrid vigor. And you you hear about it, and it's been. It's been talked about for years since I, I can remember almost, and I'm getting a little longer in the tooth, but sometimes we need to go back and look at what we can get from it and then look at the data and the research that we got today that we can use from, if we make a plan with it, it can really do some really yep. enormous advantages. Yeah, so my talk yesterday, and, and I appreciated Clay Mathis uh, gave the keynote speak, speaking address for Cattlemen's College yesterday, and, and he was hitting on some of the sort of the core um, profit drivers and opportunities for cow-calf producers, and he even called out the importance of crossbreeding in profitability of um, uh, commercial cow-calf operations, which helped dovetail right into, into the talk I gave that was really around sort of systematic selection to make cows that work well for uh, individual producers. And certainly crossbreeding is a part of that. And you know, the, the, the power and advantage of uh, maternal heterosis in particular um, is huge for cow-calf producers. And Clay made a comment that you know, it's scientifically proven and frequently forgotten. Um, yep, yep. Is, is right, and um, it, it's unfortunately one of those technologies that when you deploy it, it's really hard to see the effect of it because you don't have this parallel group of, for most producers, a parallel group of similarly managed straight bred cows to have the contrast. Um, but if you go in the, in the academic literature and certainly the trade literature, um, thousands of citations about the advantages of crossbreeding and you know I, I typically lean on the, the data from the US Meat Animal Research Center as sort of you know a really proven and long-term study in both you know differences between breeds but also how we combine those breeds and, and heterosis effects and um, you know that literature says somewhere um, between 20 and 25 percent improvement in weaning weight per cow exposed um, if you start thinking about that from a production standpoint the value of that in today's market is somewhere north of $200 per cow per year. Yeah. It's huge. It's, 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 it's huge. It's a it's huge number. Especially with our market we got today. Right. And yeah. so, and one of the things I think that, that producers often sort of forget to do is think about, um, you know, we tend to be sort of, um, we like to add and capture added value to our system. So we talk about the premiums in our business a lot, whether that's, you know, premiums from selling weaned calves or, or carcass data, uh, carcass merit. The reality is, is, Revenue is a bad proxy for profit, right? Um, and we actually should go after both ways to enhance and decrease unit cost of production for our calf product and add value to that calf product. Those aren't mutually exclusive events, right? We can do both of them at right. the same time. And so, you know, there's, I think, a, a pretty easily documentable, you know, somewhere around $300 of money sitting on the table if we have a strategically designed crossbreeding system 
and go after value and carcass merit on the calves that come out of that for a retained ownership producer. Um, those don't have to be separate things. And I think what you're really making an address in here is a systematic planned crossbreeding oh, program. So you've got a crossbred cow that's got high bred vigor, can give you the extra boost, and then you can come back in, you can call it a terminal or do a three-way cross yep. and, and import the same thing back into the cow herd or send it off terminal. Yep. You can you can really make some free advantages. Yep. Yeah, and really the, um, the trick in that is A, have a plan, and so you hit the nail on the head, um, because the crossbred cow is the hardest thing to get and maintain, like having a breeding system or a strategy to have replacements that are crossbred cows, that's the sticky wicket in the whole thing. But two thirds of the economic advantage of crossbreeding is from that crossbred cow. So she's a, she's a must have in the equation. Okay. And I like to think about it as, you know, we're starting to have these discussions in the industry about, um, you know, we, need to, we know we need to improve maternal performance. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that is make them crossbred. Um, but we also know that there's huge value differences on the far end of the chain from a carcass perspective. And unfortunately, those terminal traits and the maternal traits are antagonistic to each other often. And so one of the things that we've been talking about is how do you strategically separate those two sire selection decisions? Using bulls to build replacement heifers that are crossbred, highly focused on environmental adaptability and fitting in your production system, um, and then using another type of bull as the terminal sire on those cows. So you've got a cow, a mating decision to build a cow, and then you've got a mating decision to make a calf product. Right. And you want them environmentally adapted and market targeted. But then when we really hit reality, right? <laughs> and, and the reality of most producers is they're gonna do the crossbreeding program and they're gonna keep replacement daughters out yeah. of them same maternal cattle, the terminal cattle, and, yeah. and, and, and it's really hard. Yeah, you've got to dis, so a plan, you understand and what I'm saying. discipline to that plan is essential. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it gets off the rails. The challenge, particularly for small and medium-sized producers, is the systems that generate the most heterosis and the most value, um, you know, a two-breed with a terminal sire, um, a three-breed rotation. For large ranches that have, you know, 800 cows in a unit, those systems are really easy because it's right. you know, all the heifers from here move over here. They get bred to this kind of bull. Those heifers move over. It's easy. Right, but for a guy with 200 cows, now I need three different breeding. It's it's a mess, right? Yeah. And so that's why, in many cases, um, you know, composite or hybrid bulls have become very popular because mm -hmm. they don't maximize heterosis, but they optimize breed complementarity, um, and the heterosis is, in most cases, half to two thirds of what the F1 would be. So you know, I use the argument, you know, half is better than none. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and we in the shorthorn breed feel like we got a maternal product yep. as, as, a, as the shorthorn cow well, that and you can mentioned, contribute to a lot of that. Yeah, you mentioned you know, crossbreeding history. Um, you know, some of the, most, the earliest work um, was Bob Cook at Fort Robinson in Nebraska, yeah, yeah. and it was Hereford and Shorthorn and Angus. Yep. 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 Yeah, so there's, there's a long history and there, there, there. There's data that shows the, the Shorthorn and Angus cross cow will give you an extra calf. And yep. yep. There, there's, there's a lot of data done on this. And, Sometimes we start to overlook all this information, yeah. but we just need reminders more than exactly. anything else. So, exactly. and in another area that uh, I think uh, you know, K State's always been a leader in our industry and in agricultural. We've been fortunate to have a grant land grant university like K State yeah, to, to be there place. and and, uh, Go cats. and folks like yourself. Tell us a few things that's going on there at K State right now that that would be pretty much interesting to our livestock yeah there, so our cattle um, industry i suppose uh, we'll, we'll talk about some facilities and infrastructure stuff because there's some really exciting developments right. happening uh, on campus in the college of ag um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the research projects our okay. animal breeding groups got going on um, so uh, like like many land-grant institutions a lot of our construction was done from the 1940s through the 70s or 80s um, and uh, we've been fortunate recently to have a, a, a huge investment both from the state of Kansas um, and donors to build um, a, a new ag innovation campus um, 
facilities uh, on main campus there in Manhattan. And, and the keystone in that is a new building that, that sits between uh, Weber and Call Hall, so the two main animal science buildings, um, that'll house uh, grain science is moving from Schellenberger down by Waters Hall, which is a really old building that's in, in, in sort of dire need of being replaced. Um, so animal and feed science are gonna have a, a co-located facility. Um, then uh, agronomy is building a new research uh, facility on their campus just north of Kimball by the stadium. Um, somewhere probably by the time it gets done it's going to be a hundred and eighty million dollar investment in new facilities around uh, animal science, uh, feed science, feed and grain science and agronomy um, at K-State. Um, parallel to that project is um, a new um, uh, livestock performance arena um, north of Kimball, met by the Stanley Stout Center, okay. which you've been to before, right next to Purebred Beef Unit's new facility. About a $30 million facility for livestock events. And uh, as you know, we, we do a lot of youth livestock activities at K-State, bring in 4-H and FFA students to campus. Uh, it's a great recruitment opportunity for us, of course. Uh, judging camps, all kinds of things happen on campus uh, during the summer with youth livestock activities. And this is gonna be a, you know, replacing Weber Arena on campus um, with a new modern facility. Um, be, really be. gonna be an exciting uh, development for, uh, uh, for K-State. Um, and I think you know one of the, the, the key things is, is we continue to grow regionally as one of the main land grant animal science departments. Um, those opportunities to provide animal experiences to students is really critical. You know, you and I, when we went to college, we already had a whole bunch of that experience, right? Um, today's modern animal science student, over half of them come from urban and suburban backgrounds. Yep. Um, and there's many that come from smaller rural backgrounds that don't have lots of hands-on experience. And so we're working, and, and other land grants regionally are too, to make sure we provide those hands-on animal experiences for students. So, you know, when they go, <laughs> Shane Work, our, our unit manager at Purebred Beef, we hired, and I, when I was faculty coordinator, we, we'd have you know, six to ten undergraduates working in the unit all the time. And Shane's comment always, we'd have, you know, some piece of equipment gets tore up by a student or something. He was, you know, he was really good about realizing that it's better that that happens to that student in our environment than during their first employment, right? <laughs> yeah. They need to make those mistakes with yeah. us. Yeah. Um, we'll kind of chew on them a little bit, but right. recognize this is part of the process, right? Yeah. Um, and we want that to not happen then when they go, go out in the workforce. So um, that part of our, our program continues to grow. Um, you know, research, we've got a couple of uh, projects um, uh, of interest maybe to seed stock guys. Um, one of them's on uh, improved male fertility in beef cattle, um, so a genetics and genomics project. Um, and then another one around um, kind of getting um, uh, testing protocols and, and some sampling data on methane emissions from cows on range. Um, we know that you know as an industry that's a topic that consumers are sensitive to um, and we're trying to get in a position where we both understand that um, data um, and can use it in genetic improvement. It'll also help bridge that gap that we run into between our consumers of our product, our beef yep. consumers, and our producers at and, a lot of times. And, you know, one of the questions, and I've, I've had it here, is, well, you know, why, why do we care? Um, one, I think we care because our customer cares, right? They're asking yeah, questions exactly. about that. Um, the other bit is, you know, as an as a extension guy, I'm really interested in proving the profitability and sustainability position of cow-calf producers and right. I'm a cow guy. Um, Methane represents energy loss in our system, somewhere you know, between five and 10% blow off of methane, um, of the calories we consume go off as methane. But what if we could capture and keep those calories in the cow and make use of them? Right. Um, so I think there's a, there's a real enhancement of both environmental footprint, uh, but also in profitability. And a lot of people say, you're absolutely right. Producers say, well, it don't matter. You know, they're, they're out here in the middle of the country someplace, you know, it's a long ways to yeah. town. And they don't understand that importance because in today's world, and especially um, my own personal experiences of being able to go to Australia for our Shorthorn Conference right. and then to England for our Shorthorn There's Conference. There's other conference. places that care a lot. They care a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. A lot. Yeah. I mean, they, they've got counties that have laws in, intact. You're not even gonna be able to raise a cow there. Yeah. In, well, I in just the saw a, a news item a couple of days ago um, about a proposal in Ireland to eliminate 200,000 cows yeah. 
to help meet the country's methane emission requirement. So we're going to work ourselves out of a food supply if we're not real careful. So. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's an important factor of our business, and we got to be sensitive to it as we go. And and you know the fertility on male, the bull the bull fertility that we have when we turn bulls in the pasture to our commercial men, even our purebred breeders. Uh, as you said earlier, as we were visiting, it's a negative yep. because it's a big loss, and, and yep. it's and it's one of the bigger problems that I don't think a lot of people realize. I mean, yeah, you can be a purebred breeder and throw away two or three bulls if they don't pass, but you send them bulls out there in the field and they don't work. It, it's, it's a big problem. It's a yep. big problem. Yeah, I use the the analogy, uh, and one of our our motivators to work in this space was my experience uh, at the purebred beef unit. You know, as we push growth and performance in cattle, they have a tendency to be a little later maturing. And those bulls, a lot of times, won't pass a BSE at 11 months of age. Um, we were January calvers with a March, first Friday mm -hmm. in March bull sale. Um, getting bulls over the hump is tough. Oh yeah. And it has real cost, right? If you defer a bull and you put him through the sale ring, he doesn't sell as good as a bull that's passed as a BSC. And I use the <laughs> the story, you know, as a seed stock producer, we guarantee the bulls, right? They're gonna, they're gonna breed cows. Right. Um, at the university, it's bad enough, you know, a seed stock producer that's not university sells a bull. It's painful to replace one or write a check back to the, the guy that bought him. You do not want to do that at a university. <laughs> Explaining to upper administration why we're cutting a check back to a cow-calf guy yep. for a bull is hard to do. So we try and make sure yeah. those bulls that leave yeah, um, you know, are going to be good breeders. Um, and we want to help build tools to, to make sure that's yeah. the and, case and, around the industry. And, and, and what you're describing really and truly, Bob, is is that that link when you start talking to this supervisor that's, that's the bean bean counter right. up there he doesn't understand the cow business he doesn't understand the bull business right. and it's really difficult yep. when, when you go through that level because you just jump from here to there yep. and and we don't realize that until you have to do it yep as, yeah. as producers it's, it's painful <laughs> it, it, it is, is painful, painful i'm yeah. sure yeah so <clears throat> one of the other areas that i, I know you work a lot with as you said, you work with some purebred associations and so on. Uh, we at Shorthorn are part of IGS, yep. International Genetic Solutions. Solutions. Yep. And it's a genetic evaluation that does, I think, close to 20 different breed registrations now. And I forget whether it's two point some million head of cattle in it now. But yeah. now what's the advantage? I mean, for Shorthorn, we've seen a huge advantage. We've been in it now, my goodness, I'd have to go back seven or eight years at least yep. maybe nine yep and uh we we've seen a big advantage of being able to have that big part i mean and, and to share with you a little that i maybe never got an opportunity to share before back when we were trying to start the genomic deal for our for our breed we decided as igs was a little slow getting it up and going well let's just do shorthorn so we went and grabbed the data for shorthorn when we got through grabbing the data out of IGS, we only had 72% of the animals in our shorthorn cattle in that in that data bank were in the shorthorn breed. Okay. So that's the van. That's one yeah. area to show that advantage. Yeah. I'll let yeah. you elaborate on no, that. No, I think a that's a great point. And one of the ones I'm, I'm you know, I work with a number of breeds involved in in IGS, and we kind of do an annual update and, and sort of report card with yeah. each breed. Um, and that is a really interesting fact that, you know, as you look at, you know, Shorthorn or Limousine or Gelby or Simmental, the influence in those breeds across other herd books is really interesting. Um, of course, you know, Angus and Red Angus pedigrees kind of help tie all of us together. Um, but there is a, a, a really great opportunity to capture data and information. And I know in, in Shorthorn, like a number of other breeds, um, You've got international partners in Canada and Australia that are involved in the evaluation, and it helps support trade, right? So U.S. genetics moving internationally, um, going and tapping into new pedigrees and new bloodlines from populations that are less connected to the U.S. one and bringing those in um, has a lot of value from a population genetics perspective as well. And without the commonality of a single genetic evaluation, it's really hard to make that trade work because you don't know how different they are genetically or how similar they are genetically without that common tool. And, and, and when we look at, you know, like in our Shorthorn deal, we've got Australia. Shorthorn is, is part of the IGS system right. in Canada. So th those cattle can go back and forth. We got breeders bringing bulls in here and we yep. got 
the Australian breeders taking semen over there. So it, it, it's really opened up that genetic pool yep. that, that we really have. And, you know, the other, the other factor I think that IGS really gives our commercial breeders a huge advantage when they get ready to do this crossbreeding program we talked about a little earlier, yep. they got true comparison. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're exactly right. So, you know, we talk a lot in, in the crossbreeding exercise about the value of the heterosis, but we don't spend as much time talking about breed complementarity. Um, and so being able to go into these different populations as a commercial producer and figure out, okay, I'm gonna lean on um, shorthorn for you know, some maternal traits, maybe some marbling. Uh, we're gonna lean on a continental breed for uh, maybe some muscle and growth. How do we put those together? Well, when you've got the EPDs, you can have confidence in the decision you're making because you know what the relative levels of genetic merit is um, across those breed groups and it makes the, the exercise a lot well, it's easier, but it's also more reliable. It's so much more accurate. Yep. And then, and then we pop ge genomics. So everybody out here in the world, this genomics, it's a big yep, word. It's a big deal. They got this vision. And, and a lot of times they just think you can just grab it out of the sky and pull it in. Right. It's not quite <laughs> like that. It was that. only that easy. Yeah. yeah. So, so give us a little background so we can kind of help folks well, understand and I, genomics. I, I think the, the, the point you make here, too, is, is really important from an IGS or commercial producer perspective is that, you know, the breeds involved in IGS, because they work together, have the ability to build a state-of-the-art, world-class genetic evaluation that's among the best in the business, and I think maybe the best in the business. Um, where individually, lots of these breed partners would not be able to do that individually. And so there's the, the value of the collaboration should not be understated. Um, and you know, part of that system build out is the ability to use genomic information effectively in the genetic prediction exercise. And um, you know, there's, it's, it's fortunately gotten simpler for the end user. I don't know if it's simpler for the scientists and the technical people involved on the, the backside of the evaluation, but for the producer now, um, you know, collecting a sample, sending it off, getting it genotyped, and the information integrated into the genetic evaluation is a fairly seamless sort of process. There's hiccups once in a while, but um, that process works really well. We are now um, at a spot in genomics technology where um, if, if you're a seed stock producer and you're not using it, you're gonna get left way behind in terms of genetic merit and genetic progress. Um, I gave a talk a number of years ago at a BIF meeting that was kind of a wrap-up talk. Um, and uh, uh, Tom Lawler from Holstein uh, had given a, a talk during the sessions. And the thing that stood out to me was this idea of minding the gap. You know, he had dairy data that showed the genetic difference in trajectories of herd, commercial herds um, that were using genomics versus not using genomics. Um, and the rate of genetic improvement in the genomically influenced herds um, was nearly three times as much as the herds that were not using genomics. And the unfortunate reality of that is, is that the herds that were not using genomic technologies, even if they started today, they'll never yeah. catch up, never right? Catch and up. so as both a seed stock producer or a commercial producer, thinking about how do I leverage genomics into my breeding decisions um, is really critical. Um, because of the, the, the rate of genetic progress we can make. Um, you know, for commercial guys, oftentimes, you know, their question about, well, how do I use genomics? The easiest thing is make sure you buy bulls that have been genomically tested, right? That's step number one. Um, and the value of that is, is that bull's genomic test um, accounts for a lot of the genetic variation in that bull uh, or the genetic merit of that bull. Um, and in IGS, you know, for traits like calving ease and growth, it's somewhere equivalent to about 20 progeny. So you can think about it as, I can buy a yearling bull that hasn't produced a single calf with the same amount of information as a bull that's produced 20 calves and had all of them recorded and all the data included in the genetic evaluation. That's huge, right? Oh yeah, oh and, yeah. And for traits like calving ease and, and, and birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, um, you know, those are pretty accessible kinds of traits, but what about things like heifer pregnancy and stability and carcass merit? Um, traits that oftentimes are both very expensive to measure and take a long time. We gather all that information and put it in a breeding decision or a selection decision when an animal's a yearling. That's, that is so powerful for the commercial guy to make sure he's buying the right genetics and has confidence in doing that. The reality is today the tool absolutely works. 
And when, when breeders embrace the technology, and in particular, use it not so much for a marketing tool, but actually a breeding tool, right? So they, they go and genotype you know, most of their replacement heifer candidates, use that information in making that selection decision is huge. Um, because you know, for a replacement heifer, for example, um, we generate more information out of the genomic test for that female than she'll ever produce in her entire lifetime of naturally produced calves. In fact, it's more than double the amount of information. Mm -hmm. And so as a seed stock guy, I can plot out my herd's genetic destiny, genotyping and selecting the right replacement heifers, which is a, a complete paradigm shift, right? I mean, you seed stock producer as well. It used to be, I mean, replacement heifer was a serious deal, but you know, five years or 10 years into the exercise, you knew if you made the right decision. Right, right. right. Genomics lets you know today. Hey, yeah. Well, we're out of time for now, and uh, we really want to thank you for coming here and visiting with us. Thank you, Bob, and we'll continue this next time. So long from the Shorthorn Bullpen.